Welcome back, and it's time for our final uh, session. In fact, we have very aptly titled it as a fireside chat. Um, we're talking about reimagining manufacturing operations. And one thing which is very crucial is in terms of understanding on how to maximize productivity and how to minimize errors. So yes, it's a very feisty topic for all of you, which is why it's a fireside chat. But let me quickly introduce our set of speakers. First up, moderating and spearheading the panel discussion, we have with us Mr. Palab De, Partner Operations Consulting, PwC India. He comes with an enormous consulting experience, having managed large consulting assignments in operations area, leading to turnaround of the client's profitability in thermal power generation and distribution, mining and metal, paper, FMCG, pharma, chemicals, auto component, and much more. Well, joining Mr. Palab, we also have with us our set of speakers. Uh, we have with us Mr. Sukanta Padi, CIO, ATC Tires Private Limited. And in fact, uh, he has a humongous experience of more than three decades in manufacturing and operations, supply chain and order management, and customer service operations. We also have with us Mr. Prince Joseph, CIO, SFO Technologies Limited, who comes with more than 20 years of experience in driving the business in digital transformation and enabling Industry 4.0 by leveraging emerging technologies and executing strong cybersecurity programs for enterprises. And that also leaves us with our final panelist, Mr. Raj Kumar Singh, Senior Director, Sales Engineering, IMEA, Automation Anywhere. And in fact, uh, he brings extensive experience in pre-sales in India market, driving large transformative deals in the enterprise space. He's been leading sales engineering function for India, Middle East, and Africa at Automation Anywhere. So on that note, let's all gear up for our final session for the evening uh, with the same uh, energy and enthousi enthusiasm because as I mentioned earlier, it's a feisty topic we're talking about. With that, in just a couple of seconds, we're about to bring all our speakers on the main screen. Stay with us. We'll get the session started right here, right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you so much. I know how difficult it is uh, to be at the uh, you know uh, end session. Uh, I, I This day must have been a very good day for all of you. And we would have definitely got a lot of uh, uh, you know input and a lot of things to take to home. Uh, so uh, we are very happy to be here with all this, uh, all the panelists, uh, and we'll be discussing reimagining the manufacturing operations, the maximizing productivity, and minimizing errors. Okay, so why? I mean, first of all, let's understand why it is important. Why it is important? Why manufacturing is important for the country? Okay, so if you look at uh, uh, any idea, what is the percentage of contribution, manufacturing contribution to the GDP in India? It's, it's hovering around 16 to 17% for last uh, almost a decade, okay? And the government is really trying to push it and try to make it 25% uh, at least, you know? So manufacturing should be contributing 25% of the total GDP. And why is it so? Because uh, being a country, such a populous country, we have a lot of population, a lot of job which needs to be created. And this is one of the sectors which can actually create and uh, help us in terms of, you know, improving the overall uh, employability as well as the overall, uh, you know, development contribute positively to the overall, overall development and GDP growth of the of the country. So it's very very important for uh, for India. And uh, if you look at uh, like China, China today is 26 percent of the total GDP actually comes from the manufacturing sector. Okay, and uh, if you look at uh, all across the world, 28 percent of the global uh, production is actually is done by China. And that's why they are prospering so much. So I'm, I'm sure that going forward, we will definitely give it a lot of push, not only from the government perspective, but also from the private sector perspective. I see a lot of capital being you know, invested into building up the capacity and the sector uh, in the manufacturing sector and hope you know, it's going to become very, very important. Now let's come to the topic uh, on you know, why reimagination and why we are talking about maximizing the productivity and minimizing the errors. So, so, so ultimately, you know, if you have to capture the market, not only in India, but also abroad, we have to see that we produce the best of the quality at cheapest cost or at the least cost. And how is that possible? It can be possible only when, you know, if we are maximizing our productivity, we are utilizing our assets properly and we are minimizing the errors or minimizing the quality defects that we are producing and create the best class product uh, all over the and which can be sold all over the world and there are four pillars of a modern factory the four pillars i would like to mention over here is the iot 
the robotics, the augmented reality, and the 3D printing. If you look at uh, uh, you know uh, the robotics, there is something there's a word which is called cobotics now. So it's not only that you know you're running the factory using robotics, but actually the robotics helps robots help workers to improve the productivity and quality, and that's why the term which is called you know which which is called actually cobotics. Just to give a very anecdotal example, if you look at the GE turbine, which is a wind turbine, it has got 20,000 sensors fitted to it, okay? And there are 400 data points which actually gets generated every second. And there is an analytical platform which analyzes this data and actually help us in terms of, you know, uh, improving the turbine performance, then, you know, uh, 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 predicting the failures, helping us in doing the maintenance, as well as you know the helping us in predicting the part replacement without any failure. Okay, so these are the kind of an advancement which has happened. Just to give an example, that you know what are the kind of possibility or the art of possibility which is there in the market. Let's also talk about a little bit around 3D printing. Nowadays, you know the whole cycle time in a pro new product development cycle time has been substantially reduced. By using 3D, by using the 3D printing for you know doing the prototypes and all those things. So these are the new technologies and these are the new things which are which we have to welcome in our manufacturing sector in India. And I know that today today's audience is uh, largely from the uh, uh, from the, C, uh, the information technology side. Maybe there are a few uh, people from the manufacturing side as well. But who else other than the uh, the, the technocrats or the information technology uh, or CIOs, okay, who can actually help the manufacturing sector in terms of uh, going ahead with this path and making India one of the best place for manufacturing or maybe the manufacturing house for the whole world. So with these uh, few words, I uh, would request, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Padhi to uh, express his thoughts on the on the theme of today's discussion, which is reimagining the manufacturing operations, maximizing productivity and minimize errors. Mr. Padi. Thank you, uh, Pallab, and uh, good evening to everyone. Well, uh, this is uh, a topic that's very close to my heart because I've been uh, working as a manufacturing and supply chain professional all throughout my life. And in the last three, four years, uh, you know, I am having this position of CIO. So who else can be, you know, under, who can be a better position to understand the complexities and pains of the manufacturing professional and help them with this uh, new technological convergence, which is happening. You know, if you, we could recollect, we had, uh, when I actually started my career 90, I mean, 30 years back in 1990, the productivity, when we talked about the manufacturing productivity, we talked about, you know, uh, mechanical automations, you know. I mean, in the Indian manufacturing shop floor, we still had a long way to go in terms of, uh, you know, your controls, PLC controls and, you know, electronics and you know, IT automation to actually make presence in the manufacturing shop floor. So largely when we talked about the productivity improvement, the productivity improvement were basically thought about as a, you know, a mechanical automation. Then to, after 10, 15 years, we saw, a, you know, plethora of, uh, you know, uh, electronics and IT based automation coming into the Indian manufacturing sector. And that continued for quite a, some time till about, uh, early 2000s when uh, the ERP technologies uh, landed up in the Indian manufacturing sector and that gave a major boost to the manufacturing productivity where we had the ERPs, uh, you know, and the uh, electronic uh, control systems actually taking the uh, productivity of Indian manufacturing to the next level. And now when we are talking about industry 4.0, it is basically the convergence of the operations technology and the information technology, uh, which is actually will, uh, taking us to the next level of uh, productivity and uh, quality revolution in the soft load. Now, how is this possible? It is possible basically because of some of the advances which we have made in the technologies like, you know, your uh, collaborating platforms, IoT, and Pallav had mentioned some of things like 3D printing and all of that. But a 
major uh, technology which is really now sweeping the uh, Indian manufacturing operations is the big data analytics. I think what has happened is through this uh, operation technology, the manufacturing companies have really acquired a real-time data, which is wealth of uh, real-time uh, data. So data acquisition was a big problem, even though we had you know, ERPs, but entering the data into the ERP system, be it in terms of the production quantities, the machine detail, the failure rates and the defect percent, it was a humongous task. I know we were struggling for after implementing ERP for you know many years, we were struggling to capture the real-time data and the data were not really uh, you know, accurate data. So we really struggled, even though we had the ERP system, we really struggled with the acquisition of data. But with this operation technology capturing the real-time data and that to the data and coming in from various sensors, so there is an emergence of uh, you know, data and that to a good quality real-time data coming in. And we need to really think about how do we utilize or capitalize this data for improving or taking our manufacturing soft load to the next level of productivity of frontier. So I can give you one example of uh, you know, uh, what's the power of this data. Like for example, we have a discrete manufacturing scenario where we were uh, having you know, you know, hundreds of machines and uh, one SKU can actually be manufactured in minimum 30 to 40 you know, uh, machines, right? So similarly, we have thousands of SKUs which get produced in, in all of these uh, equipment, but given a choice, what is the best optimal route for an SKU to be produced so that you have a better output, you have better quality, and you have a better energy consumption. If you really make use of these data and come out with some prescriptive analytics saying that this SKU or for this group of SKUs or this group family of products, this is the best optimal route, we really can take the productivity. We're not talking about productivity in terms of manpower. We're talking about productivity in terms of your yield, in terms of a quality, in terms of your energy, all that can be really taken into the next uh, you know, level. Uh, so with that, I would say uh, we got a enormous opportunities in the manufacturing soft floor with this convergence of you know, uh, uh, OT and uh, IT. And the role of uh, CIO is far, far higher compared to what it was maybe you know, 10 years back. So it's really exciting times for both manufacturing professionals and the CIOs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Padi. I would uh, request uh, Mr. Uh, you know Prince uh, Joseph to you know express his thoughts on the topic of discussion today. Thank you. Um, after listening to both Pallab and Sukanta, I don't know what else is left now, uh, but you have stolen half of my content. Um, but I'll take one step back. You know, to me, uh, and the role of the CIO. For me, you know, when I was going through my own experience and reflecting on what what I have. Um, what I, where I have worked. I have started my career in airlines, in airport management, in moved on to hospitality, travel, tourism, logistics. So my stint in manufacturing is, is only the last two to three years. But any industry that you go into, um, as the head of IT, as the head of the technology strategy, you know, you, you're always driven by some base fundamentals. You know, um, you're driven by what is the customer demand for that business. You're driven by what are the best practices that you want to deploy and implement. You're driven by what are the compliance and standards um, that, that is relevant irrespective of who you are. You're driven by your life cycle management process and the uh, culture that you want to bring in. And one more thing would be the, the risk that you have and how are you going to be helping the business to, to mitigate those. So in, in light of all this, uh, when I looked at, you know, the, the role here and what, what's the scenario now, and especially with the, uh, with the um, uh, pandemic coming in and forcing us to have a review of many things that we did, uh, the disruption actually helped us to refocus and reprioritize quite a few things. So the data-driven initiatives that were kept and they were slowly moving ahead, suddenly got an impetus because you are working blind to, a, to an extent. And you also had different 
demands on the data right now because you want to know exactly what can we do. There's a lot of permutations that need to be worked out. So if you have a customer commitment and if you don't have operators uh, and you, you still need to hit that target, you know, how do you manage that? You know, what can we do? Uh, what, uh, and that, that, was giving us, uh, that was giving us new challenges and the new, new solutions needed to be involved. For that, you, know, you just need to get the right data to the right people and get the right analytics done. The second part would have been more to understand about uh, our customers who used to be able to come into our factory, do inspections. Now they can't do that anymore, but we still need to maintain the quality standards and get them to accept the, the product. So how do we actually enable that to be done? So suddenly remote access technologies plus uh, enforcing uh, methodologies for IP protection, which we have not really strongly thought of in the past um, and, and re-architecting many things around that flow also became very imperative. So uh, where I look at is, you know, to me at the moment, when I try to, to look at my North Star, I say, I'm going to be driven more by what industry 4.0 demands, because that is going to be guiding me and the organization to where we need to get to. It's not that it's prescriptive. It's actually giving you some guidances, some guiding principles are there. And along with that, you know, you, you move forward and you try to make the right decisions, tools, technology, process, um, and help uh, the organization. And, and I think in this context, one tool that you know, really stood out for me was something to do with the advanced planning and scheduling, which is driven by a lot of the data that, that is ingested by that tool. That seemed to help uh, produce an output which was driving production plans. And that was actually one, one, one area where I thought that is, an, that is a, uh, you know, a, a tool that actually, uh, uh, this was the right moment for that tool to be, to be uh, shown the, or, or to be showing its importance. And many more are there, but that's, with, with that one aspect, maybe I can stop this segment and move on. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Prince. And uh, let me now request Mr. Rajkumar Singh to you know, uh, share his thoughts. Thanks, Palab. Uh, so, as a as a so as someone who represent a technology provider uh, here in this in this forum, and someone who bring some bit of uh, manufacturing experience, the start of my my career way back in uh, mid nineties, uh, I would I would like to touch upon uh, basis what uh, Mr. Padi and and Prince have, have talked about. So they've talked about uh, predominant uh, changes that have happened over the over the course of years in manufacturing operations and with the advent of industry 4.0, the ITOT integration, there's a lot of focus within uh, manufacturing. But if you look at uh, the entire manufacturing value chain per se, we still see uh, there are quite a lot of automation gaps. When I, when I look at... Uh, an organization's overall business processes cutting across everything. We uh, we, have, we have done some bit of analysis and we, we uh, figured out that there are still almost around 80% uh, processes that require to be automated. And we have so far have automated only 20% of uh, them. This percentage is uh, quite high when we look at uh, manufacturing core operations within the, within the four walls. But when we look at the, the value chain, this particular percentage is significantly high, may not be as high as uh, 80% that I talked about the entire enterprise. How we can solve this problem? One answer to solving that problem is if we can augment our knowledge workers or people who are working with technology, augment them with what we call digital workforce. And when knowledge workers and digital workers or a digital workforce work in each and every system in the in the world, we will have a scenario where everything will be automated. Now that's a that's a utopian uh, desire we we all have. Uh, how much of that we can do? Which are the areas that we can uh, talk about? Is something that I want to briefly uh, touch upon. One important element with digital workforce is that that the improvement potential is tremendous. Uh, where a, a physical worker or a knowledge worker is bound by a certain time that uh, he or she devote while working, a digital worker can work 24 by 7. Uh, these, are, these are bots or, or robots per se, software robots or uh, 
uh, robotic process automation agent or bot, whatever we call them. So they bring uh, extraordinary efficiency in, in some of the processes. They completely eliminate chances of human error in the processes. That significantly reduces process errors. I'm not talking about uh, manufacturing process error, but I'm talking about process error when it comes to uh, data integration, data capturing, data ingestion into, into system. And third element of this digital workforce coming in with the knowledge worker is the human bot collaboration that we can establish, where we can take best of both worlds. We can have efficiency of bots and we can use the uh, human intelligence and, and experience. And this is, this is the way in which uh, manufacturing organizations are uh, making a significant change. I've been, I've been um, working around uh, some of the manufacturing customers and, and I was looking for some uh, information. Came across one, uh, one, one paper, research paper uh, that was recently published. I think it was uh, published in uh, Jan 2021, uh, which talks about changes that are happening in additive, in additive manufacturing. And, and Pallab, you talked about uh, additive manufacturing, uh, which is commonly known as uh, 3D printing. Uh, how uh, automation can can help in a typical scenario what happen uh, you have a process engineer who create uh, uh, the process uh, identify it then then take it into a, a cam system create the 3d visualization of that once that 3d visualization is done then what the process engineer does it analyzes the result then based on the analysis a selected a suitable uh, process parameters are selected and then they are passed on to your uh, 3D printing or, or uh, additive manufacturing uh, location, whatever it is. What RPA or a, or a digital workforce can do in this particular space? Once designer does the 3D modeling, RPA takes over. The whole process of running CAM software, running models in CAM, taking those CAM uh, extracts into different uh, parameter selection for processing, looking at those parameters, analyzing multiple models and arrive at the right set of parameter that give you the most optimal uh, result, then pass it back uh, to your uh, additive manufacturing unit. This entire process can be uh, automated. Now, what it will yield, it will yield a significant increase in efficiency of the process and reducing your complete uh, time of introducing a new product. Additive manufacturing, one may not be uh, taking it to the industrial level right now, but if it is used in NPDI process, I can significantly curtail my uh, NPDI uh, process time. So highly, uh, I would say, a potential to to impact my uh, efficiency and reducing my uh, errors reducing my quality issues by eliminating uh, some of the human errors so that's one uh, element which was not touched by uh, sukanta and and prince i just wanted to to talk about where i can i can take a technology combine it with the knowledge workers or human workforce and create a human bot collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj. In fact, you know, uh, uh, I was uh, inspired to talk about, you know, one of the clients we are talking about, and this is a very hazardous operations. And uh, it has been now discussed, it is being discussed that instead of, you know, pushing the human being into that operation, can you have robots who will go and do that? Okay. So it could be a, uh, you know, high temperature zone, or it could be a, you know, a high, uh, you know, a kind of gaseous zone and that kind of thing, you know, where the human being cannot sustain. So these are the things which are being discussed about. And we know that, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, 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 maybe Indian army is also thinking to assist, you know, uh, assisted warfare. Okay. Why didn't you use the drones as well as the robots yep. in place of, yeah, in place of actually the human being for uh, physical uh, bots. Uh, yes. Physical Absolutely. bots. Yeah. Physical bots and also these things are definitely there. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing up this. Now let's go to the, uh, you know, uh, direct questions and maybe we need to be 
uh, uh, slightly con uh, concise in our in our reply because the time is limited. <laughs> the first question is, uh, you know, uh, we know that maximizing productivity and minimizing errors are thought to be the core operation domain. Okay, as I uh, continuously discuss this with my clients, I find that you know, uh, this is a uh, uh, you know topmost area for any operations guy to discuss. Now the question is that you know all of us are from the IT department and CIOs. Now, how is the role of the CIO is evolving onto it? What are your experiences? What are the things the CIOs can do more in terms of you know, collaborating with the you know, operations guys? And it's, it's not either or, it's not a, you know, replacing somebody, but how we can complement uh, the operations. Uh, so uh, maybe Mr. Padi, if you can you know, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, actually there are two approaches which uh, you know, many companies have adopted. Uh, because as I was saying, it's uh, uh, the manufacturing automation or manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, technology is not really uh, neither in the core domain of manufacturing engineers, nor in the core domain of IT. Now, it is a convergence which has happened, you know, when to get the best out of it, there has to be a convergence of, you know, OT and IT, which we are seeing you know, largely uh, happening across all the, you know, companies. So obviously, you know, uh, you need to have those uh, IT, uh, you know, experts having a little bit of, you know, understanding of the manufacturing, core manufacturing operations. Without that, it is not possible for the IT organization to really influence the manufacturing organization. Similarly, manufacturing technologies or manufacturing process engineers at the you know same time cannot have the full uh, you know uh, uh, potential you cannot really imagine the full potential of the integration of these two so what is really happening now is that since these are two i mean uh, very niche uh, domains and uh, overlapping you will not find a lot of expertise who is having you know both in ot and it it is very very, very rare to get it so what we have done is so if you have to really uh, do the, do a you know i would say integration of this what we have done uh, is that we have uh, kind of embedded the it organization into the manufacturing organization when i say embedded the it organization into the manufacturing organization so we have say each plant we have put a uh, it person and we have created a central manufacturing it cell right who uh, you know, reports into the CIO as well as reports into the, let's say, the head of manufacturing, right? So that way we are embedding the IT into the manufacturing organization. That's point number one. Point number two, if you look at any of the manufacturing organization, you know, in India context also, we will have this, you know, manufacturing excellence group. You will have mm -hmm. some, say, the, you know, companies having continuous improvement because continuous improvement is I, I think now embedded into a lot of manufacturing companies because of this lean six sigma and many things which they do so this manufacturing excellence or the continuous improvement is you know kind of a culture which is uh, prevalent in many of the uh, manufacturing industry in india as well so you actually the cio can leverage that organization the ci organization or manufacturing excellence organization and give them take inputs as well as give them an outside view in like what are the technologies which are available today and can we reimagine all our operations in you know take, take, keeping in mind the potential of these uh, you know kind of technologies right so embedding the it into the manufacturing organization and collaborating with the ci and manufacturing excellence because these are the guys who are continuously looking out for uh, improvement opportunities in the manufacturing organization. If the CIO can collaborate with these organizations <laughs> as well as embed the IT organization into the manufacturing, I don't think you know he will be an outsider to the manufacturing uh, company. So that is my view of you know uh, how CIO can play a role in the core Absolutely. manufacturing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Padit, thank you so much for your valuable inputs. And I understand that, you know, embedding, okay, and, and collaboration is the main important thing here, rather than, you know, thinking it either or kind of a thing. Okay. And, and what I will do is that, you know, because uh, uh, Mr. Prince Joseph has already uh, addressed this topic during his speech, I'll request Mr. Raj, if you can, you know, uh, express your thoughts on this topic uh, on the role. Yes. Well, I'll just take uh, one uh, 
point and and possibly add a little bit to that which mr padhi have talked based on my experience of working with the manufacturing organization in in last 23 24 years what i have seen is for driving these kind of excellence and innovation in initiatives setting up what uh, mr padhi have talked about center of excellence or center of innovation uh, makes really really a great sense uh, have seen working fairly well in quite many organization these are units which comprises of uh, of uh, manufacturing people people who bring uh, technology experience and then they collaboratively think and come out with uh, use cases to be adopted for, for uh, the excellence initiative use cases to be adopted from an innovation perspective these are the ones who will look into newer technology how to bring uh, artificial intelligence how to bring machine learning uh, prince also talked about mr padhi have also talked about the the emergence of significant amount of data today that is available with us uh, in in real time how some of these technology like machine learning can be used on top of that <laughs> to bring meaningful outcome for uh, manufacturing uh, domain people so it's a combination of domain and technology enthusiasts together in a collaborative working model that's something that i have seen working fairly well and i would i would suggest that if if our colleagues can can look into that those who are in the audience definitely we can uh, derive value out of it yes yes thank you thank you thank you raj and uh, thank you for bringing up this uh, such an important point and and that reminds me you know because i belong to a steel plant initially 15 years of my career as working in a steel plant so blast furnace gas is a very hazardous gas and because of the carbon monoxide presence okay and people will simply die you will not even know okay and in those days what used to do is there used to be a small bard so anybody who is going up the blast furnace for any maintenance or any bending work they will carry the bard the bard sensitivity to co carbon monoxide was more than the human sensitivity so if the bard starts dying it means don't go ahead and you just come back you know it looks like a story okay but but i have personally seen that happen uh, okay and but today today you know we have all the sensors which is available and 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 if you don't get a integrated clearance you just don't go there so that's the kind of an advancement which is possible which can actually not only increase the productivity and quality but also save human life safety yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah thank you so let's go to the next question and uh, the question is on you know we know the digital operation has caught up and there is a lot of working you know which is going on and different people are doing different kind of work okay now how digital intervention is helping companies to improve the productivity and reducing the errors uh, i would request the panelists you know to share some practical example very very practical you know one or two examples mr padi you know and then uh, after you um, uh, mr prince joseph you know both of you can share your uh, you know live examples that what complex problem solved by this yes okay right so let me first take the you know errors uh, part uh, case use case uh, you know because uh, in our case as the example i was giving you that uh, uh let's say you have a machine and is to uh, it will receive some input and it will give you some output and there is a schedule you know uh, which is handed down to the operator or maybe in a erp system or in a planning scheduling system you will find out that this machine is uh, supposed to produce this part and uh, on this shift or this uh, particular day and uh, it will have uh, you know this input now in a discrete manufacturing and in a uh, you know uh, uh, area where you have one operator taking care of multiple machines obviously there are chances of human errors that you know a wrong input part can go into uh, you know uh, a machine which is it's not supposed to have it in this particular case there is a also a heating and cooling cycle let's say there is a you know recipe you know you have to heat it and keep it at that temperature and then cool it so and the plc that plc of that particular individual machine will have this heating and cooling cycle now what we have done is that there is again an it's an integration of uh, uh, your it and ot so the, our erp system will have all these bill of material routing and you know recipe data and then you have a uh, a scheduling system which will say okay this machine is supposed to produce this particular part on this particular day and basis this information then the recipe gets automatically you know downloaded from the erp system to 
uh, the PLC system through this uh, uh, integration technology. Now, what we have done is that this was the basic purpose of uh, this integration was to, uh, you know, have uh, product traceability and, you know, visibility and all of that. But then the idea given by our continuous improvement department was to, how do we make this, uh, you know, uh, whole process, okay. meaning, you know, the operators are having, uh, you know, wrong inputs, putting into this particular machine and giving us either unsafe operation or, you know, rejected uh, quality of uh, the product output. So what we have done is we have uh, done a simple process of, you know, of course, each input part is barcoded and then the operator first scans the machine. So when he scans the machine, uh, you know, the application knows that this particular machine is supposed to be producing this part. And this is the recipe, which is already there in the local PLC system of that machine, right? So this is the information which we have through scanning this particular uh, machine. And then when he scans the input, then the system actually looks at whether this input as per the bill of material data, is it for this particular finished product? So if this, you know, uh, uh, if the checking fails, if that doesn't happen, then it, the system does not start at all. Operation, you can't start the operation. There's an interlock. The press doesn't open at all, right? So this is one use case of actually, you know, integrating the PLCs with the planning system, with the ERP system to make what is called as digital pokayoke. You know, Japanese have various visual poka, okay? yes, but I am giving you an example of digital poka. Okay? Of course, this process of uh, mastering this process of digital poka okay, is not an easy one because the fundamental problem what we are seeing in a, a soft floor, especially discrete soft floor, is that wrong label codes given to the Stickers. you know parts. <laughs> so if that process is not right, then you you know your digital poka okay is not going to really happen. Well, this is the biggest challenge. In a visual poke, okay, you know because of the you know visual system that the operator, it is easy for him to do it. But if you have a digital poke, a very powerful system you can build, provided you know uh, uh, we actually uh, make the visual errors actually you know come down. Absolutely. But yes, there will be of, of course uh, one fundamental issue which we are seeing also today, uh, which is really will be pushing our uh, um, you know, uh, manufacturing operation software to actually go for digital poker is the talent uh, pool which is available for, uh, especially in the, you know, mid, not low skill, but, you know, the mid skill, medium uh, skill, uh, medium skill uh, uh, operations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Joseph, if I may ask you your, you know, thought on this. And following Sukanta is such a tough, tough, a tough task. Uh, but I will just, give a, you know, a couple of things, maybe a little on a tangential line, because only after coming into manufacturing did I get a whole new meaning for what legacy means. Because if you're in an airline or if you're in any other place, your legacy is actually legacy application, legacy this, but here you're actually seeing legacy machines. You know, we still operate in an environment where you have a 25 year old machine still uh, in production and you have a two year old or one year old machine. So when you try to, and, and uh, looking at, and, and just going back to what Sukata said, when you do an ITOT integration, which is mandated these days, this is a tough job because you actually got legacy, which you can't do this to. And you need to figure out some clever ways to actually get data out of that system. Without doing that, your entire data fabric is not complete. So we have a, we have a challenge and a big gap there. And the other thing is, and again, you know, I'm going to just follow on with uh, what follow on from that where uh, Mr. Sukanta and, and uh, Raj are speaking. Um, we we keep this, seeing these these instances of shadow IT and things, but uh, the solution I think I just got it because from what Mr. Sukanta said, he's actually creating a shadow business uh, inside inside the business. So he's putting IT people there, and they're just taking care of operations to an extent. And that, that's a good, good, good way to go forward. So on the quality aspects of error reducing, you know, I'll just come back to the technical side. You know, Six Sigma is, is very, very key. Now, if a customer was happy with uh, a CPK value of one, and then he said, no, you know what, I need CPK of 1.33. And now if he says, I need two plus, uh, we need to start doing things differently. So that is driving a lot of improvements and that's gonna drive minute uh, re-evaluation of process steps. 
So uh, the stages that we go through, you know, uh, is already been explained. So how do we actually achieve this? So some of the, the simple things with the stickers itself, I'll just carry on with the same examples that we had. If the labeling, labeling has got some information, you make the labeling rich at each stage and you start scanning. And if you find that, uh, and, and previously we were not able to catch uh, components that were actually expired. Uh, which flow comes into the into the yeah. flow. So now yeah. eliminate that straight away. Second one, yeah. one things that go into rework and it goes into rework one time, comes back, uh, send back again, second time, send back again, third time, send back again, fourth time, you know, we can make a call saying after the second time, just reject it outright. Yeah. So there are, there are areas where we can actually control and improve things from, from those perspectives. And uh, the other area would have been, you know, like uh, what Raj said earlier on the whole NPI and PD stage itself, that whole structured approach over there, you can you can actually create many new product being, in, being introduced. You can actually ensure that the right level of uh, process automation policies. Uh, and, and that's where I also see that 3D printing can play a real, a real uh, a good role in, in uh, in giving improvements. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will skip the next question and go to the fourth question, which is, you know, for reimagining re the future of the operation, what kind of ecosystem a company should build? I mean, do you think that everything can be internally, uh, you know, developed, all the capabilities, or what kind of an external network, or how automation companies can help the organization in this, or maybe some of the startups? And to that, what kind of a skill should be developed within the organization? I'll request uh, Mr. Raj Kumar Singh to start. Sure, Bharat. So I think interesting point. Uh, so today it's it's not it's not one way whether it is internal or it's external. It's a hybrid play ecosystem. We we are in a network economy, so working in an ecosystem is inevitable. Now. As a, as a technology, what we can do to improve that, a uh, couple of things that come to my mind and I just want to briefly highlight that. One is how we can make the collaboration uh, easy. So in in, many, in, a, in a normal scenario, we you collaborate on one process where if, we, if I look at my complete uh, manufacturing value chain, I start collaborating right at the stage of designing. From designing that collaboration moves into my sourcing. From sourcing, it moves into my inventory. From there, the collaboration moves into my subcontracted manufacturing and then uh, goes into uh, a, a network fulfillment or uh, network logistics. So working in an ecosystem is throughout the value chain and how we can make that collaboration with the help of technology simple is uh, the most important thing. Automation can play a significant role because uh, without making any change to the underlying technologies or underlying systems, we can create what we call a single pane uh, across uh, uh, different systems, or or we can create that that one single interface that can be used then to to integrate and be that collaboration channel. Uh, and second point, which is extremely important while working in an ecosystem, is to provide the right set of experience to ecosystem partner. That's another important element. Whether you are in a in a uh, in an ecosystem of buyers or you are in an ecosystem of sellers, having a right set of experience for your partners is extremely important. And improving efficiency through automation is another important aspect that can help uh, some of our manufacturers today. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Raj. In fact, some of my clients, when I discuss this topic with them, they said that you know they don't, they intentionally do not want to develop certain capability within the organization Absolutely. because you will not be able to give a career path to those guys. Okay, uh, and they said that you know we we are intentionally not designing those because it's better to remain outside and we will hire and you know use uh, that expertise. So I think as we see that the the world is becoming more and more you know interdependence. Okay, so so you have to depend on others. Uh, rather than let's see. Okay, so on, on the same thing, uh, Mr. Padi, if you can you know, express your thoughts. Yeah, so I think uh, building an ecosystem uh, is very, very important these days. As you were saying that, you know, you really cannot have uh, the entire skills in house, and neither you can outsource completely those skills. Both are not possible. So as Raz was saying, we have to have a hybrid of these models, definitely. And more and more, uh, you know, expanding a very few companies I've seen, they are uh, 
tech nuts, you know, even though they are in the, uh, uh, you know, business of manufacturing and operation, but, uh, you know, the technology, one such company, which I had worked, I started my career was Asian Paints. They, they, you know, they are tech nuts, you know, even though they manufacture paints, but technology is their one of the key strengths. So buying those kind of companies, uh, you know, other companies are actually more and more uh, adopting these hybrid models, which makes pretty sense. Okay. And as I was saying that building your ecosystem has to be a very strategic, uh, you know, uh, 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 priority because as you are, we are seeing that more and more new technologies are coming, existing technologies getting matured. So if you don't have an ecosystem, you really cannot innovate. You really, for innovation, obviously want to do some experiments. You want to do some pilots, right? So for uh, doing a pilot, obviously, you know, uh, the big boss wants to minimize the cost of failure because not every pilot will just go through. So if you have to really minimize the cost of failure and also without causing much disruption, disruption to the business, how do you do the pilot? And for that, you have to really look at list vendors. And these days, uh, I think a good development is happening around building ecosystems. Now, earlier, when you asked me about uh, you know, ecosystem, I was just saying, okay, my all big you know, vendors, established vendors, they are my ecosystem. No, today you have a lot of options. You have you know, the niche vendors, you have established vendors, you have even, you know, on-demand experts, right? You have these uh, gig on-demand talent and, you know, sometimes if you really invest, you can get really good, uh, you know, on-time, uh, you know, uh, experts, right? And uh, also there are people who are, you know, calling themselves as sourcing experts. Sourcing experts means they're only specializing on getting you, a, a, you know, talent, or a solution provider or a niche you know uh, you know vendor to you so they they are expert in discovering a you know a vendor for you so there are so, such kind of people so they all are part of your ecosystem actually what we need to do is that uh, we need to look at a five year roadmap of it uh, or uh, say what we want to really do look at a, do a skill gap analysis and then you know find out what skills you want to really have in-house and what skills you want to do really outsource and then, you know, come out with your, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem and then, then source the, uh, the, your vendors and partners accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Padi. I uh, will skip and go to the last question uh, and I will request uh, uh, Mr. Prince Joseph to, uh, you know, respond to it. Uh, the question is, you know, how do you ensure that every business process is lean? and uh, how to uh, eliminate the process and the workflow waste across the enterprises and what kind of a you know again the question is that what kind of a role a ceo can play in this whole journey okay so i'm going to bring a little bit of the elements of the previous question into this as well because the demands of the new uh, the, the new um, uh, environment now or customer environment now requires us to have capabilities that we in house are not able to have ourselves, but at the same time, you know, one of the themes that I uh, strongly believe in, and I think I was hearing it from the other speakers as well, is uh, when when we look internally, what we have is is a, a great set of domain knowledge. Uh, when we look at partners, they bring in tool knowledge, whereas the 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 uh, merger between these two, there's that that, that bridging. That is where our domain experts actually needs to, to step across a little bit and gain some competency in that part and vice versa from the other side. Because unless that bridging happens properly, you know, we don't see the real ROI coming through from uh, many of the tools that goes in. So when you look at you know, how you want to, to, uh, uh, to move forward with a, ensuring quality in everything that we do, uh, Quality, the QMS aspects or the, or the QEM aspects is not something that any manufacturing organization can escape from. That becomes like front and center because uh, right now uh, IT gets called in for uh, customer audits. How are you ensuring certain things? How are you providing certain things? You know, we can always say traceability is easy, but traceability needs to be proven on so many levels 
as you sit with the customer. Um, IP compliance, IP protection needs to be proven on so many levels. Uh, anything to do with enterprise security or anything to do with data management just needs to be done where every step has caught some system which is doing it and you can't show some manual evidence and get away with it. Um, and the, uh, the other part is, and this is something where I'm also thinking is a gap, uh, not with respect to this per se, it's about this, uh, we see open source, we know that whole, you know, there's, there's this community development, but when it comes to our space, I'm not seeing, uh, or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not really plugged onto that yet, but I would love to see a community development or a community uh, a space where uh, tools, processes, all of this can be discussed. Actually, it, it is now dependent on uh, a product forum rather than, uh, rather than an, a community which actually helps to, to bring this up. Um, with, the, with the whole focus on quality again, see at the end of the day, uh, every control, uh, every process control that you deploy, um, you can define in your documents, you can define that you've got controls in every aspect, uh, SPC, you name it, control charts are being done, etc. But to ensure that, that that is done, to ensure that that's been done in a timely manner, because we also face scenarios where because of documentation delays, we have not been able to ship a material out because this needs to be shipped along with all those packed in. So uh, the, the focus on IT trying to go and having to uh, ensure that uh, a particular business process has happened, uh, evidence is there, systems have collected the data, and this data goes into the format and the repository needs to fit into without errors. That whole loop needs to be, needs to be complete. That means you, you've, yes. got a, you've got a completely connected, you've got to have a completely connected process now. Yes. So yeah, that's that's where I see us going into more hyper connectedness, uh, and that I think I believe is the path towards Industry 4.0 again. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Raj. If I can request you for your last thought because we are over the over the hour, and uh, you know, uh, quickly if you can do that, yes. Yeah, I'll I'll just take uh, possibly thirty seconds to uh, quickly comment on your uh, point around lean and how we can eliminate the wastage in process as well as workflow. I think uh, we have to look at the the age old business process ranging, but it need to be looked in in a different manner. We cannot look it as as a as a waterfall. It has to be taken in in agile mode. Uh, process by process, look into a process, look into the improvement area, and then implement those impl uh, improvement area. There are ways and means today to get the ROI much quicker because you don't need to make fundamental changes in your in your uh, technology system. You can have wrappers, uh, APIs. You can you can have automation layer, which is surface automation, any other kind of automation. That way we can make those process changes much, much quicker today. And then we can move from one process to another process rather than looking at it as a big bang business process ranging uh, initiative that we typically used to do when we used to go for large enterprise uh, application uh, adoption scenarios. That's my, my one, one point to it. Thank you, thank you, Raj. Thank you so much. In fact, uh, we have come to an end, and uh, uh, all the three speakers, uh, so much of input they have given. It is very difficult for me to actually kind of summarize it out. But I have just noted down a few words, okay? And I wanted to leave a few thoughts in the mind of the audience. Uh, the first thought, what came to my what the first one I have noted down is the complex problems, okay? So the the problems have become more and more complex in the supply chain, in the operation, in the manufacturing, and we need to solve those complex problems together, okay? The next one, which I have noted down is understanding of others areas, okay? So we cannot say that I only know technology, okay? I have to understand what is operation, and the operation has to know technology. And not only, you know, within the organization, we have to understand what are the kind of capabilities that lies outside the organization, okay? What are the, and that's how we will be able to develop the network. So that's the second point I have written down. The third point I have written down, is on the collaboration, okay? So gone are the days, you know, when, you know, we are you know, remaining silos and, you know, trying to excel within our, uh, you know, silo. Uh, but but I think what is required is that we, we more collaborate more with each other, with external parties, even internally with the different depart departments and divisions and see that, you know, how, you know, we can do best. 
The next point I have noted down is on the big data. Okay, so initially there was a problem of collecting the data, but now there is a lot of data. Now, what do you do with the data? Okay, what are the what is the synthesization you are doing of the data? How are you using the data for uh, for you know the better uh, uh, betterment of the manufacturing operations, the quality, and all those things, or maybe you know reducing the new product development cycles. So that's something which you have discussed. I think there is something which is personally there for me for the learning. Uh, is the digital poker okay? I have never thought about it, Mr. Padi. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Okay, we we profess to our clients that you must do poker okay, but those are you know largely physical okay. But digital poker okay is something which even I am learning from the session. Okay, then I think you know we uh, talked about you know building the whole ecosystem. It is so important. You can't uh, you know you can't uh, uh, be uh, uh, in silo, and you have to build an ecosystem. And ecosystem doesn't mean only within the organization. It means outside the organization and let me tell you that today whatever you are doing uh, is nothing but in building an ecosystem we're learning from each other we're talking to each other we are getting the you know uh, the coordinates of you know uh, for some of the prominent speakers and we can reach out to them for the future support and lot so this is the part of the this can be viewed as a part of the building an ecosystem then the other point which i also like during the discussion which came up and is a learning for me is that how the automation can help help you know human Okay, or human assistance. These are the particular word which was which were used. Uh, it's very important. It is not to replace the human being. It is to augment. Okay, I mean, I think since last so many uh, hundred years, we have been saying the automation is, is going to replace human, but it's not. The prosperity in the world has increased. Okay, the the the, the disease level and the sufferings in the work world has actually gone down because of all the automations and all the new development in the technology. Okay, and. The last one, you know, which I have noted down in, is, you know, identifying the improvement areas to have a have a practical plan, okay, of action, uh, and and actually really work on that. And what uh, you know, Mr. Raj mentioned was the return on investment is very very important. Okay, it cannot be a theoretical exercise. We are not running colleges, we are not running universities that we will be doing the researches. We have to see. Yes, there will be failures, and we have to take the responsibility of the failures and move ahead uh, proudly, uh, taking the learning from that. But overall level, if you look at the kind of investment that we'll be doing, we must be sensitive to the return on investment for the stakeholders, the capital who has put the capital, who has employed the capital, and see that you know how can you know get the best outcome. So uh, that's the summary which I could put. I, I'm sure I have lost a few points on the way, uh, but very, very happy if there is any other comments, any other comment from the panelist or anyone else to hear to that. Uh, that's all. I think you have summarized it fairly well. Thanks. Thanks a lot. for Thank you. 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 Thank